Okay, thanks for uh, inviting me this afternoon. Um, I'm going to tell a bit of a story to give some context to where we are and perhaps help us understand where we might go. And that starts with just uh, looking at our landscape, basically, and saying, why does it look the way it looks? Uh, basically, um, as we went into the Second World War, the country was about 50% food independent. We used to get lots of food imported in, from intensive farming in the Dominions and the colonies. And as we went into the Second World War, we very rapidly have to, had to become 100% food independent. So lots of land was put to the plough, drained. Post-war, we realised we didn't want to be in that position again. And so Clement Attlee's post-war government, 1947, introduced the Agricultural Act. And that act put our farmers to work. We produced very intensively. We, they were subsidised too. Land was put to the plough, land was drained. We, we brought in crop types from northern Russia. Uh, we brought in uh, all, all sorts of different varieties of mechanisation. And we really intensively farmed the land. Now, over a period of time, that, that was fine. But we started to notice that uh, there were lots of externalities that we weren't really keeping an eye on. And these things only really came to public attention in the sort of 60s with books like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And we started to notice that chucking around DDT, et cetera, not only is bad for, for farmers, but also very bad for wildlife. And so we started to notice this demise. And as a response, we, we designated areas under national parks, uh, Countryside and Wildlife Act. And we, and we, we protected the bits that sit, still seemed robust. And that was very essential at the time. Uh, but when I first started work in the conservation industry, that's what, what there was, and it covered actually a very small part of the land. The, the majority of the rest of the land was in between those protected areas and didn't have much uh, in the way of protection itself. So, and, and, and I also felt that that kind of fortress conservation did, to a certain extent, disenfranchise people um, from, from the environment that uh, nurtured them. So when I started in conservation, we, we looked at working in those bits between the protected areas. And we did something that's called, in, by socio-economists, it's called community conservation. <coughs> and that's where we look for win-wins uh, for, the, for the people who own the land in between those protected areas. So this, for example, is a, is a fairly badly treated bit of river, very low biodiversity scores, trampled banks, etc. For about 250 pounds, you can fence that and you see all biological attributes improve, water quality attributes improve. This is on the River Tail, one we did quite a, lo a long time ago, so we have some good perspective. It costs about £250, and we can, just by talking in terms that the farmer understands using econometrics he, he believes, we can advise him to do that very rapidly. He'll have payback on that within a year. It's worth about £400 a year, in just, just in terms of stock control. In terms of water management around the system, so if we, if we got the farmer here to put in £20 worth of guttering, he can save nearly £2,000 a year just by harvesting and using the water. And that doesn't include all the savings he makes keeping that water out of the slurry system, not having to spread it to land in the winter, not having the risk of pollution, damaging his soil, fuel costs with the extra journey. So, so it's, it's easy to sell, and we, we, we did that very effectively for a while, but we started to realise that only the real strong argument economic arguments were sticking. And some of, the, some of the more marginal economic arguments were being overwhelmed by you know, international forces like the price of Russian wheat, etc. Would, would, you know, if they had a couple of bad wheat harvests in Russia, people would put, put the land to wheat. And so we started to realize that we needed some stronger arguments. But we'd also, we'd also noticed that there are a wider set of beneficiaries in addition to the farmer. Um, and we started to think about how we, could, uh, how we could look at the services those beneficiaries were getting in addition to the, the benefit to the farmer. So a quick reminder, I'm, all your, I'm sure you're all familiar, these are ecosystem services. Uh, they're all the things that society needs from the land, ecosystem goods and services. The interesting thing to note that in this region, 75% of the land is privately owned and managed, for better or for worse, by 1%, less than 1% of the population. And the driving forces behind what that 1% of the population does are basically production markets. And the rest is delivered, undelivered, limited, pretty much pell-mell without much strategic planning. 
What you get as a result is an imbalance of the ecosystem service provision from the environment. So you get a massive overrepresentation of services associated with things with markets. And I've got here a natural ecosystem, but that's back in the day when you had sort of market towns, city states, and you're much more directly reliant on the services in and around you, as well as the ones you, 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 you could actively market and sell locally. And we decided that the way to to combat this imbalance, you, you would think regulation would look after those <coughs> dwindling and diminishing services, but, but clearly it hasn't. We're failing, we're failing by, to meet uh, all sorts of directives. Millennium Ecosystem Assessment tells us that most of our ecosystems are in decline. Water Framework Directive tells us that most of our water bodies are in decline. So regulation's not working. And we decided the best approach were, was to create markets for those missing markets to, to, balance, to balance the equation. Now, how do you go about that? Basically creating a market, there's, there's the theory and there's the practice. So the theory is you establish a willingness to pay with one of your beneficiaries, and that relies on having a good cost-benefit argument. I then believe you need an ethical broker. That, that helps optimize the transaction costs in the market rather than having lots of people trying to do deals. But I also think it can stop runaway capitalism. If you think, for example, you create a really effective, powerful new market, and that's got direct access to the provider, won't you just get another equally undesirable outcome? So an ethical broker in between there, and I'll return to that. And then you have a willingness to be paid at the other end of the scale. The, the farmer has to be willing to farm other ecosystem services for money in addition to food, food production. So our first effort with this started with Southwest Water back in about 2003. I used to work for the West Country Rivers Trust, who worked with Southwest Water to develop this idea. I now work with Southwest Water propagating this idea. But basically, we were able to establish that it, it was more cost effective to work on looking after the raw water quality than it was to invest in the infrastructure to clean that water. And so we invested in raw water quality, less in cleaning the water, and we had lots of ancillary benefits from doing that. We used local charities as the ethical broker, and the farmers were quick to adapt to payments for farming, different, different things for us in addition to food markets. So it was very successful. But how do we balance that with the rest of the society's needs from the environment? We were the water company. We obviously wanted good water quality and good overseas and storage in the catchment. But we needed to embrace the fact that there Water Framework Directive needed to be met. There was a Bathing Waters Directive, Habitats and Species Directive, Drinking Water Inspectorate and World Health Organization standards. We needed food. Uh, we need rural access for, for the good of, for the good of our, our sort of souls. And we, we needed to accommodate a whole raft of society's needs. So we looked into how other people established what they wanted from the environment. And this was a bit of MSc work done by some Plymouth University students, actually, in an afternoon. They looked at the plans for what we should do on the River Tamar. And the number of plans uh, deciding what we should do on someone else's land for the River Tamar are astonishing. All of them working at odds with each other, very few referencing each other, all of them fighting with different pots of money to do a different thing on the same bit of land. And it really is quite astonishing. Um, all of them sectorally driven. So, Back a few years ago, DEFRA approached us as the West Country Rivers Trust and South East Water as a lead organisation working with, with the West Country Rivers Trust to try and, and, and put together an integrated type of map, a type of uh, plan that everyone could buy into. So on the Tamar, you'll recognise the Tamar here with Plymouth down at the bottom. Basically, we got together all the stakeholders we could think of, farmers, the Environment Agency, Natural England, academics, parish councils, local councils. There are about 60 or 70 institutions at these meetings. And we mapped ecosystem service opportunities in the catchment using a GIS system. So the top left there, you can see it's like a heat map. The red areas are where you can very effectively achieve good water quality. Right, going right down to here, spaces for wildlife. That takes all the wildlife information we have and basically lawtonizes it. I don't know how, how familiar you are with the Lawton report, but that said we need to have bigger, more connected areas of protection. That basically lawtonizes that. And so we did that for all the ecosystem services, and we came up with an integrated map for ecosystem service opportunity delivery. And Southwest Water have been working very hard 
during that process, and we have lots of plans in the future, to deliver those ecosystem services in those areas because it's cost beneficial to us, I remind you. So this is some of that moorland blocking we were talking about earlier. Is that really 10 minutes? <laughs> right, I'll spin on through. Uh, moorland grip blocking, uh, lots and lots of farm restoration work over the years. And basically what you get for your investment is rather than a farm that just produces food, you get one that produces food and clean water and all of these other environmental services that are essential for society. And you get support and delivery of all these directives. Last, last few seconds. Um, so basically, some of the markets are working quite effectively. The water company market, the integrated planning, and the provider, it's all working very effectively. We are literally paying the farmer for the ecosystem services that society's decided it needs from those integrated plans. Carbon, well, it, it's coming on our ability to offset in this country using various means. It is working reasonably well. The elephant in the room really is food production. Um, at the moment, there's loads of externalities. We buy food very cheaply, and uh, I, I think that, that, that's a tremendous potential force for good. Flooding's very topical. How, how much should we work upstream to ameliorate flooding? Depends where you are. And biodiversity, really, if we have to fund biodiversity conservation directly, we failed in all other respects. Biodiversity should be what we measure to see how successful we are at living on the land. We shouldn't have to fund it in a zookeeper-like way to maintain it. So, sorry to overrun. That's <laughs>